in this first segment is Lane Deal, attorney at law. Good morning, Lane. Thanks for coming in. Good morning. Thank you for having me. You're uh, always welcome on the program, of course, especially whenever you're ready to tour the world. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Lane, uh, let's talk about uh, the split of DHHR, which uh, is, is imminent, and any improvements that have been made in regards to working with youth in our courts and the child services situation in West Virginia. Have you observed any improvements over the last six months? Um, well, you know, I have seen some, yes, I have seen some improvements. There's still a lot, there's still a long way to go, I think, but uh, the just recently, I think the uh, DHHR has been split into three parts, mm -hmm. is my understanding. And those three parts are, um, it's not fully implemented yet, but they have secretaries assigned. There's a lot of meetings going on trying to uh, coordinate exactly, you know, how the structure is going to work and what the chain of command will be. Um, we have had uh, meetings here in the Eastern Panhandle with representatives from uh, the department as well as representatives from the Supreme Court and helping to um, inform us of what those changes are and also in getting feedback from the local judges and attorneys on you know what additional improvements could be had. What well, I, and we know it hasn't split yet but it will soon. But from a practical standpoint, what do you expect to see the effect of that to be in the courtroom as the it filters the down to these kids? Well, uh, for one thing, I think one of the, the, the biggest changes that they've made that has made a difference is in the changes in the wages for the local workers. So they are um, bringing on additional people. Um, there's a significant amount of training that goes into being a CPS worker, an mm -hmm. ongoing worker. So it takes time before we actually see them in the courtroom, but we are seeing additional workers um, that are that are coming through. Um, but it is a slow process. Um, in terms of the split at the top, I think what we'll see is that because you're going to have three secretaries reporting directly to the governor, each facet will have its own interests that it can advocate for at the top. So hopefully that will allow for, you know, some additional um, emphasis to be on each of the three areas, one being social services, which mm -hmm. is, you know, where um, we see currently DHHR and CPS working in the court system. What's the caseload typically in a, a daily or weekly basis in our courts with these cases? Uh, the caseload with the courts, um, I think we're I think we're I don't know if we've hit 200 yet for 2023 but we're we're quickly approaching the 200 mark typically we uh, so the way that the case style is written you have if you ever look at a at a case you'll see on the um, the civil action number will have a number at the in the beginning which is typically the year so like 23 and then a dash and then the type of case so an abuse and neglect case would be what's called a ja case and then the number after that is the number of the the number the the number of the case um in that year mm -hmm. so when you start to reach 200 that means you're you've had 200 cases filed in that year and okay. we're getting close to that how does that compare 20, to 2022 it's pretty much the same so we've hit the you, uh, we're we on usually, pace to be the yeah, same. Yeah, we usually hit get close to the 200 mark. All right, very good. Bill? Yeah, uh, we had a, a lady from CASA on the other day, and she said she's given a number of 400, Lane, that there are 400 kids that are in the system. Approximately 200 are represented by an advocate once they get to the court system. The other 200 are not represented by an advocate. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, one... What percent, how understaffed are we at DHHR for child custody? Do you have any sense at all? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, but I do want to back up just a minute okay. to explain the difference between what I was talking about and what CASA may have yeah. um, talked about earlier. It is very possible that we have 400 children that are in the system. Yeah. With each case, you have multiple children often that are involved in that one case. So even though you have that, you know, the case with, 
um, and also just because the case was filed in 2023 doesn't mean we don't have a flow over from cases from 2022 sure. and even 2021 right. because sometimes these cases take a couple years before they get resolved so that will probably um, account for the discrepancy between the 200 mm -hmm. and the 400 mm -hmm. that CASA may mm -hmm. have talked about in terms of the caseload um, the research that I've done, the um, Council for Accreditation and other accrediting bodies that, that look at social service work and child welfare usually recommend between 15, sometime on the high end of around 22, 25 cases for an ongoing worker. We have ongoing workers with 100 cases. Good grief. Uh, instead of 25, 100? Yeah. A hundred, yes. This, this, I think, is the point that Charlie Trump picked up on last year in the uh, in the various hearings. They were just uh, uh, three to one more than what they should have. Right. Yeah. And and for a lot of us, uh, Lane, we do not have the familiarity with, uh, with the system like you do. And I say that fortunately we are not exposed to it because I would imagine it's very, very emotional and very difficult to deal with at times. But the, uh, the caseworker uh, comes in when there is an immediate problem with, a, with the environment that the child is in. CASA comes in only when it gets to the courts. Is that correct? Yes, well, there are multiple phases of okay. a CPS investigation. So typically they appoint a CPS worker to do CPS the initial now. child protective okay. services. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they will um, assign an investigator. If a referral comes in, there's a, um, there's a centralized intake office that accepts referrals throughout the state. That's where anybody can call in anonymously, indicate you know that they have a concern about a child when that, that referral comes in. There's an initial screening. If it's screened out, then it, it goes away. If it's determined that it's a, a legitimate complaint, then it's assigned to an investigator. The investigator has a number of days. I believe it's 10, but don't quote me on that. I'm not absolutely sure, but they have a number of days to get in front of that child, look at that child, make sure that the child is safe, and begin their investigation. They complete what's called an FFA, which is a Family Functioning Assessment. That's one of the initial documents that we receive in, as an attorney in the, in the um, abuse and neglect case um, that just describes that ongo that investigation, that initial investigation, who the CPS worker interviewed, um, who, they, uh, who they met with, um, uh, different reports that they may have reviewed, their assessment, and whether or not um, abuse and neglect was substantiated. And in a substantiation by the department in the FFA then triggers an abuse and neglect petition to be filed. Once the abuse and neglect petition is filed, then the court will appoint CASA as well as the attorneys for the, a, a guardian ad litem for the children and attorneys for each one of the parents. Abuse and neglect, they generally walk hand in hand, are they? Or do you find do you find on occasion that it's mostly neglect and little abuse, or is it are they generally hand in hand? Well, uh, they're defined differently in the code, but I think that a lot of times when you have abuse, you have neglect and vice yeah. versa. Um, what we're seeing primarily right now, and, and some of this, I, I don't know whether this is just like the focus that, because it's the, the most extreme cases, because I see a lot of um, physical abuse cases which seem to kind of um, not get as much attention as I think that they need because there's such a focus on the drug, the um, drug culture and the number of parents, particularly mothers who are having children um, that are drug affected or parents who are using and have children in the home to the extent that it's compromised their parenting skills. So that's um, neglect. Now if a, uh, if a parent, if a, if a mother has a child and that child is born drug affected, that's considered abuse because mm -hmm. the child was affected while it was in utero and then was born with, with um, symptoms of withdrawal. So that, that is considered abuse. Um, also abuse is, you know, physical abuse, sexual abuse, that's also abuse. But a lot of times when you have drug-affected parents, you see abuse as well because it's just, you know, the, it just things start to spiral downward when you have, um, you know, drug addiction in the home. Clearly the system has been overwhelmed, <clears throat> excuse me, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And the decision was made to go ahead and split up a DHHS to be um, these, these three different departments. 
And we've talked about streamlining the processing of the cases. We've talked about hiring more case officers and this sort of thing. Is there anything that in, in the new legislation that is geared toward addressing the problem, turning off the spigot of, of abused and neglected children? I mean, we're trying to find more and more foster homes, and, and that's another problem, too. But it seems like there's this this in my estimate, this is new territory for me, but it just seems like an unusually high flow of cases. And, it's, and the cases originate with families, and you know, I don't know what the cause and effect is, but is there anything within the legislation that is, is geared toward that part of the problem? To, to making it unnecessary, to be able to fire more case officers because they just don't have enough to do? Well... I've yet to find a case officer or a case worker that doesn't have enough to do. No, 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 that's do. not. There was, okay. there, there was, I, was, I was making a point that if, if we can put them out of business, that means that we don't, we have fewer cases for them to manage. Okay, well, the legislation hasn't changed a whole lot in the last several years. Um, what we're seeing the changes in is just the organizational structure, which I think is more through the rules and the, and the um, DHHR policy. Um, but... I do think that the focus on reunification is an important way to work through not having as many fo not needing as many foster families for instance if we can focus on more preventative care so that we can help a mother at the time that she realizes that she's addicted before she has a drug affected child as opposed to waiting until a child is born drug affected and then filing an abuse and neglect case can we get that mom into treatment earlier um, treatment facilities are overwhelmed as well because of the opiate epidemic and with fentanyl now it's just even it's even worse so um, getting those services in place I think are the mo is the most important way to try and and get caseworkers doing not having as much of a of a burden the repatriation of uh, the children with their families where the abuse started do we have and in a perfect world the problem is solved and they go on and have a fine childhood and, and do we have a feel for what the recidivism rate is if that's the right word that the kids are returned and then they have to be taken out again it happens more frequently than we would like and one of the pieces of legislation that i understand um, was looked at during the last session was adding what's called an aggravated circumstance in the event that a parent is substantiated for abuse and neglect is adjudicated as an abusing and neglecting parent and then the case is successful in an improvement period and then another case is filed then an aggravated circumstance in a new petition would require that would actually eliminate the requirement that the department make reasonable efforts to reunify the family right now that's not the case so unless there is an actual termination of parental rights there's not an aggravated circumstance if a parent right now um, is adjudicated as abusing and neglecting a child and then is not successful in an improvement period and their rights are terminated if they have another child then a new petition is filed and that's an aggravated circumstance which means the department doesn't have to make reasonable efforts to reunify the family i think what the legislature was looking at last session which i think some of the judges at least one of the judges i know is really interested in them looking at again is if there's an actual adjudication regardless of whether they're successful in an improvement period, if there's another petition filed, that that's an aggravated circumstance so the department doesn't have to make reasonable efforts. It would free up a lot of the time for the caseworkers, a lot of time for the courts, because we wouldn't have to go through another case for somebody who's already shown that they can check a lot of boxes, but they haven't really overcome the conditions that caused the abuse and neglect petition to be filed in the first place. Lane, you, you made a very good point. Uh, you're making a lot of good points, but I, I tend to think of the backlog been with a number of caseworkers and they they overwhelmed with a number of cases but also there's also a backlog or bottleneck with the court system itself is it not oh yeah I mean well we're gonna get another judge so mm -hmm. I think that will that will help us some but yes we have um, two judges in Berkeley County right now and one in Jefferson County that are devoted entire not entirely they have other cases as well but they take on the majority of the abuse and neglect cases and they have have full days scheduled just for those cases um, in addition to that you have just a handful of attorneys who are willing to accept the appointments and just speaking for myself you get to a point where you have and you have 
enough appointments that you cannot effectively represent your clients if you start taking more. So you have to tell the judges, I can't take any more cases, at which point they don't have additional attorneys. So a lot of attorneys take on maybe more than what they really, you know, really feel like they can in order to try and help. Um, the problem with that when we do that is that nobody's being effective in helping these kids because we're all just, you know, scrambling, just trying to get through the process. And the way the regulations are written, um, the, the statutes are written, there are a number of hearings that are required throughout the case that um, take away time from actually being there with the family and working with the family and working with services. As guardian ad litem, for instance, I'm responsible for putting together a disposition report at least five days prior to the disposition hearing. It can take me several days to put that report together because it's a comprehensive report of every investigative effort that I've made, my recommendations, what all documents I've reviewed, how often I've spoken with the children, how often I've spoken with the parents, who others, the other people who I've spoken with, anything related to their education, health care. So it's an enormous report. It's helpful. I understand the reason for it, but it takes time away from me being able to actually be with the kids, make sure they're okay, communicate with caseworkers, be out in the field trying to resolve the issues that caused the problems in the first place. Is there a magic bullet that we can take uh, that will resolve the problem or at least address the problem, as you're saying? Legislation of any sort? Yeah. Um, I, one of the things that I have advocated for and I think could be really helpful is if we looked at some kind of accreditation for the state, because currently the state is not accredited to be providing the social services. The Council on Accreditation does accredit other states. And the reason why I suggest that is because you're familiar with the self-study process. Yes. As opposed to hiring somebody to come in and do a, a study and just kind of look at a bunch of people and interview them and then give a report to the legislature and, you know, us pay $3 million or whatever we pay for that. A self-study process is much more introspective within the department. It involves all the people at every level actually looking at what they're doing, looking at um, outcomes, being able to find evidence for what's working, what's not working, so that that's put in the form of a self-study and a report, and then you have an accrediting body that comes in and is evaluating that, making recommendations. So your changes are actually substantive, in my opinion, as opposed to just throwing spaghetti at the wall and hoping that some of it sticks. You're actually looking at the evidence, you're seeing where the outcomes are, you're tying those together, and you're making decisions and solutions based upon that evidence. It's a more timely process or time-consuming process. It's more expensive, but I think that overall it makes more sense if we really want to address the problem. But so that's the the long-term solution addressing the problem. But still, we have the short-term problem. We do not have enough staff. It's my understanding. Uh, we do not have enough caseworkers. It's my understanding. Even if we had more money uh, to uh, to hire more caseworkers, they're just not available. Yeah. Well, stop the flow of fentanyl. That would be, I mean, if you want a magic bullet, that would be one of them. Yeah, and you're exactly right. And that's the that's what we should all be striving for. But that's been a very tough nut to crack. Sure. As a consequence, we're still left for the problem. Yeah. How do we address the problem that we, we're left with? Right, right. And and I think we're doing that to an extent. I mean, I th these meetings are helpful. Um, you can meet yourself to death, so we can't spend too much time with that because, again, we are trying to spend time with the kids and make sure that the services are there for them. Um, but investing that effort, getting the attention of the governor, which I think that we are getting now that we'll have three secretaries. Um, I know that we have um, some of the, um, you know, higher-ups in the legislature that are paying a lot of attention to this issue so it's not going unnoticed having just you know inviting me here to be able yeah. to talk about it so that people know what's going on um, one thing that I've always found interesting and I understand the reason why we have confidentiality in our um, cases for abuse and neglect because you do want to protect the privacy of the children and the and the other individuals involved but what that also does is a lot of things go on behind closed doors and the public really doesn't know they don't have a right to go in and see what's going on in these cases so without you know hearing about it in kind of a more general sense in forums like this the public really isn't aware of, of how bad the problem is let's take a look at this for a second from the from the child's point of view what actually happens when the 
the event at home happens and the and the child is separated either permanently or, or temporarily. Walk me through the steps. What what happens to the child? What does he or she see and do? And, and where do they go? Where do they spend their first night? Okay, so I mean, it it depends on the circumstances, obviously. But typically, if you're dealing with a ch- child that's born drug affected, then you have a CPS worker that's coming into the hospital. Oftentimes, um, that CPS worker is talking to the family to see if there's a kinship relative that's available that is willing to take the child. The same thing with the children that are at home. Um, there is a at least they're supposed to be an emphasis on trying to find a kinship placement. A grandparent is a is a preferred placement, but other kinship is also acceptable, even what they call fictive kin. So for an older child that might have a best friend that spends a lot of time at the you know, at that that home and knows that family well, that would be fictive kin. Um, so you're looking at people that can provide care for the child with as less trauma as possible um you know if there's no other option then you're looking at foster care and you have to hope that there is a foster family that's available to take the children um but there's a chronic shortage of foster there is a a shortage of foster parents yes so and you want to make sure that the foster parents are trained i mean we we want more foster parents but we want trained and and quality foster parents that you know are able to care for the children and we also want to make sure that as much as possible we can keep siblings together you know those sibling relationships there is research that indicates that that sibling bond and those sibling relationships are some of the most important relationships we have even sometimes more so than the parent (coughs) than the child parent relationship especially when you've got abuse and neglect situations so when you can keep those siblings together it really helps keep down the amount of trauma that the children are going through because they have somebody to rely on one of the points that i think we tend to overlook is the care and love and concern the individuals throughout the whole process demonstrate with the caseworkers, with the attorneys that are involved, with the judges. I know several judges that are, that that they're so committed to doing the right thing to CASA, to foster uh, parents. So we have a major problem in front of us, but we have a cadre of folks that are working hard with the child's uh, care care and love and care in mind. So. Oh yeah, I, I mean, I don't think that we could have better judges on our cases yeah. here in the Eastern Panhandle. They are all, the one I work with all three of them, and they are all so committed to making sure that this, um, that the the problems that we're seeing in the process are fixed. Um, they, you know, they are understanding of the, the challenges that the caseworkers have, but they will hold them accountable. They're, they'll hold the attorneys accountable. They they hold the, the parents accountable. And, and the attorneys I work with, I think they all, we're all doing the best that we can, um, but it is a struggle sometimes just because of the case. Level. How many attorneys in the so-called pool? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, there is a list that okay, you can get okay. from the Supreme mm-hmm. Court, um, but I work with, the, it's usually between, uh, I'd say maybe about 20. 20, okay. Yeah. That and I'm how do you get paid, Lane? Well, uh, there are two ways you get paid as a guardian ad litem. Um, abuse and neglect is one um, is one way, and that is through public defender services. If you're appointed for, so a lot of times um, there's a, I think there's, you know, a relationship between what we call the JA cases, which are the abuse and neglect cases, and then your delinquency cases. A lot of times you have kids that are acting out, older kids, and so, you know, they're um, detained, and then a juvenile delinquency case is filed, and then when a guardian ad litem is is appointed, you find that a lot of the acting out is due to problems that are associated in the home. Sometimes an abuse and neglect petition is filed after that. Um, But if it originates in a JD, then that's paid through the West Virginia Supreme Court. Is any of the work that you do from federal code or federal laws at all state? Well, there's a reimbursement piece that comes through the federal law, which is um, referred to as Title IV-E. So in any, and it's through the Social Security Act, um, any time that we have a hearing, if there's a child that's in the department's custody, the court's required to make what's called 4E findings, which means is the department making reasonable efforts to achieve permanency? Are they making reasonable efforts to reunify the family? And there's a number of 4E requirements. There's what's called a judicial bench book that we can all look to that has like the sample orders that are um, 
you know, um, the preferred language to have for those four E findings. Those four E findings are required in order for the department to get reimbursement from the federal government for their child welfare services. And that four E finding has been a helpful tool, I think, for some attorneys. I use that sometimes. If we're not seeing the efforts made that need to be made, I will make the motion that the four E findings find that the department is not making reasonable efforts. And mm-hmm. when those F, when those findings are made in a, in an order, that floats up and it gets the attention of Charleston. And you know, I think people start to try to you know fix where we're having problems within the system. Lane, thanks. We're out of time, Bill, so you can't go with that one. But the final word is yours, Lane. Anything else that you'd like to relate that you haven't had a chance to cover? Um, I don't think so. But, you know, I always like to at least put that um, hotline up there. Let me see if I can find that number real fast for the DHHR centralized Mm -hmm. intake. Is that number going to change when they split? I do not believe so. No. Centralized intake. Um... West Virginia. Yeah, yeah, you look that up while I tell everyone who the sponsors okay. were this segment, if that yep. works for you. WVU Medicine Berkeley Medical Center, Jefferson Medical Center, leading health care here and everywhere. Also by Hagerstown Ford, you can get your next vehicle from their website. They deliver it to you. And if you don't like it, they'll actually take it back at Hagerstown Ford. HagerstownFord.com. Lane Deal has been our guest here on the program as we've discussed some uh, child issues here in the state of West Virginia, foster care and Uh, care for these kids who are in the system, so to speak. And I have the uh, abuse and neglect hotline here. Centralized intake is 1-800-352-6513. 352-6513. Thank you, Lane. Thank you.